What up, WeHo? This month, we're looking forward to 2018. I resolve to see a Congress that is much more blue and a White House that is much less orange. Welcome to WeHo TV News. Happy 2018, West Hollywood. I'm Mike Siriaco, and I'm bringing you everything you need to know about WeHo, courtesy of the city of West Hollywood. A lot has gone down since we last saw you, well, last year. So let's catch you up with the WeHo windup. Let's put 30 seconds on the clock. It may not have been a holy night, but it was definitely a silent night when everybody snubbed the White House tree lighting ceremony. Things look brighter and better attended at the World AIDS Day candlelight vigil. Hark the Jennifer Latham sings, glory to the Winter Sounds Holiday Jazz Concert. Nailed it. In honor of the holidays, West Hollywood celebrated Christmas, Hanukkah, Kwanzaa, the Winter Solstice, and Festivus. The tradition of Festivus begins with the airing of grievances. I got a lot of problems with you people. And Trump pulled an Adele Dazeem when he started slurring his speech during a press conference on Jerusalem. I believe we have that footage. My holiday wish is that his tweets can be as articulate and intelligent as whatever that was. But before we stuff our stockings, let's stuff our news briefs. The City of West Hollywood and the West Hollywood Sheriff's Station held its 27th annual West Hollywood Toy and Food Drive through December 22nd. Now, I understand many WeHoans are health conscious, but just know that in the future, it's okay to donate carbs. On December 2nd, the West Hollywood Library hosted a STEAM Family Fun Day, which featured learning and activity stations for all ages. STEAM is an acronym for Science, Technology, Engineering, Arts, and Mathematics also known as the arch enemies of Betsy DeVos. <laughs> also at the West Hollywood Library, Women in Books met on December 5th to discuss Bryn Greenwood's All the Ugly and Wonderful Things, a novel about a young daughter of Midwestern meth dealers. Coincidentally, All the Ugly and Wonderful Things is my nickname for Tinder. On December 9th, the Swedish Women's Education Association, Los Angeles, hosted a screening of the Palme d'Or winning film, The Square, followed by an award ceremony for its annual film scholarship. This year's winner was Sarah Gamble. In addition to the film scholarship, the Swedish Women's Education Association Los Angeles also awards a lesser known culinary scholarship. And I believe we have footage of last year's recipient. What a lovely young lady. The City of West Hollywood's WeHo Arts Program presented Puppet Theater on Wheels production of The Snow Queen with performances in both English and Russian. And to be clear, Snow Queen refers to the Hans Christian Andersen tale that was loosely adapted into the film Frozen, and not a drag queen made out of snow. And that's the family-friendly version of that joke. Now before things start melting, let's get out of these news briefs. On December 23rd, the city of West Hollywood hosted the Avante Ballet Studios performance of beloved holiday ballet, The Nutcracker. This family-friendly fairy tale was composed by Pyotr Ilyich Tchaikovsky, arguably one of the greatest composers of classical music ever. And while Tchaikovsky never set foot in West Hollywood, his life shares several parallels with that of contemporary Weehoans. First off, Tchaikovsky was incredibly progressive. Back in the 19th century, Russian music was highly nationalistic, incorporating elements of folk music and rejecting Western influences. Ah, nationalism. That first step towards xenophobia. Isn't that right, 1939 Germany? Or 2017 Charlottesville? Tchaikovsky, on the other hand, was much more experimental, combining the best elements of Western and Russian music. The result was a body work that included some of history's greatest pieces of classical music, like Swan Lake and the 1812 Overture. Tchaikovsky was also gay. He wrote about it openly in a number of letters that have since been published, cementing a seat in the pantheon of LGBT musicians alongside such greats as Freddie Mercury and Elton John. Unfortunately, Russia in the 1800s was highly homophobic, and not even Tchaikovsky was spared from it. So, the composer's official cause of death is said to be cholera. Russian plumbing back then was so gross that water had to be boiled before you drank it. But some claim that Tchaikovsky drank unboiled water on purpose. Supposedly, he was so distraught over an unrequited love, he killed himself. Another theory was that he was forced to drink it, either by the Tsar as punishment for his homosexuality, or by a group of his former classmates to cover up his sexual orientation and avoid shaming their alma mater. We may never know for sure, but 
Neither theory isn't too surprising in light of what we know statistically about the LGBT community. According to the Trevor Project, LGB youth are five times more likely to commit suicide than their heterosexual counterparts. And according to FBI analysis, members of the LGBT community are more likely to be targeted for a hate crime than any other minority group. But in a Dan Savage It Gets Better twist, Tchaikovsky's talented body of music has, in a sense, made him immortal. Over a hundred years after his enigmatic death, people are still performing his symphonies and ballets, giving him a happy ending that is less like Swan Lake and more like the Nutcracker. And for more on amazing musicians, Eddie Robinson hit up one of the Sunset Strip's most beloved divas. Take it away, Eddie! In West Hollywood, a star sighting or chance encounter with a celebrity is not a rare occurrence. In fact, it can happen at your local grocery store or your favorite restaurant or right here at the City of West Hollywood Library as presented by the City of West Hollywood. I'm Eddie Robinson and this is WeHo TV News. Through its WeHo Arts program, the City of West Hollywood recently presented the first in a series of periodic talks with notable residents and creatives in West Hollywood. Titled Artists and Icons, the inaugural subject was none other than Frances Elizabeth Taylor Davis, in conversation with fellow West Hollywood resident Trip Mayen, Senior Vice President of Global Experiences for BeautyCon Media. It's quite a journey that I've been on, and the fact that the second part of my life of being out here in West Hollywood, it was just fantastic the things that continue to happen. So I'm very happy with West Hollywood. Although best known as having been the wife and muse of Miles Davis, one of the most acclaimed and admired jazz musicians of the 20th century, Frances Taylor Davis is also a pioneer in the dance world who studied ballet with the famed Catherine Dunham. In 1948, Davis became the first black ballerina to dance with the Paris Opera Ballet. She also appeared on Broadway, in film, and on covers of many of Davis's albums. Frances spoke about how her own artistry and creative eye for talent influenced Miles Davis. With Miles, there was a company called Roberto Iglesias that came to New York, and I thought, Miles, I, I would really like for you to hear and see this company. And he didn't want to really go, but finally he agreed. And when we left that theater, we walked to the Colony Record Shop, and he brought every flamenco album. And the next day he called Gil Evans, and he said, I want to do this album. And he called it Sketches of Spain, and it's one mm. of his classics. That was because of me. Davis is regarded as West Hollywood's original diva, and she became the hostess at the famed Roy's Restaurant in WeHo. She also spent time as the hostess with the mostess at Chasen's, La Dome, and the Hamburger Hamlet on the Sunset Strip. I always felt that I was still on stage. I felt when the door opens, the curtain goes up, and I'm on, I'm performing. And I guess I touched a lot of people, and instead of calling me hostess, they started calling me Maitre Diva, and then later, it was just the Diva. Discover more upcoming events from the city of West Hollywood's WeHo Arts program by visiting weho.org slash arts. I'm Eddie Robinson, WeHo TV News. Mike, back to you. Thanks, Eddie. While it's important to start the new year with charity, it's equally important to start the new year in one piece, specifically by not drinking and driving. For more on this, we go now to Asher Rodriguez. I'm at the West Hollywood Sheriff's Station where the city of West Hollywood kicked off its annual Don't Drink and Drive campaign with a powerful message to community members about drinking and driving during the holiday season. I'm Asher Rodriguez and this is WeHo TV News. According to the CDC, every day 28 people in the United States die in motor vehicle crashes that involve an alcohol impaired driver. West Hollywood Sheriff Captain Sergio Aloma addressed the crowd about the dangers of driving drunk and provided safety tips. If uh, you, you're out and about celebrating this holiday season and uh, you have a few drinks, it's important that you have a plan, uh, take public transportation, uh, ride share, have a designated driver. City officials, sheriff deputies, and community ambassadors also walked to nearby restaurants and bars to distribute 100,000 drink coasters with printed messages reminding patrons to utilize ride share, a designated driver, or the WeHo pickup. The coasters feature the dispatch numbers to seven taxi companies licensed to pick up in West Hollywood, the link to the free pickup line shuttle in West Hollywood, and they also include West Hollywood social media information. 
Don't forget West Hollywood. Even one drink can impair your judgment and increase your risk of getting arrested for driving drunk or having a crash while driving. Be responsible while you have fun. Reporting from the West Hollywood Sheriff's Station, I'm Asher Rodriguez for WeHo TV News. Thanks, Asher. And for more fur-covered coverage, we go back to Eddie Robinson and WeHo TV News' official canine correspondent, Zoe Robinson. The city of West Hollywood is known as one of the U.S.'s most animal-friendly cities. And now, West Hollywood's four-legged canine friends ah. have two new places to play. I'm Eddie Robinson, and this is WeHo TV News. It's estimated there may be as many as 2,700 dogs or more in West Hollywood, all looking for their fun in the sun. And now, in addition to the William S. Hart Dog Park on DeLong Prey Avenue, dog lovers and their companions can now enjoy two new off-leash dog park areas right here in West Hollywood Park. We spoke with Senior Project Management Supervisor Christina Sarkis to find out more. The incorporation of the dog parks into the West Hollywood Park Improvement Project was a result of intense community design involvement and participation. There's actually two dog parks, one on the east side and one on the west side of the basketball courts. The large dog park is specifically intended for large dogs and it's approximately 7,000 square feet. And the dog park west of the basketball courts is designed and intended for small dogs and it's approximately 4,000 square feet. The dog parks have dog water stations and there is a canine artificial turf that is specially designed for dogs. Christina also told us about the overall expansion plans for the park and what we can look forward to in the future. The dog parks are the first phase of construction to open. The second phase will be the Aquatic Recreation Center that will open in 2019. And then the remaining phases will be the Children's Playground, the Heart of the Park, and the AIDS Monument, which are scheduled to open in 2020. The dog park is definitely a great addition to the park. Um, you know, I wouldn't really have any place else to play with my dog. The yards are small around here, of course. <laughs> he wants to get down. <laughs> but uh, yeah, um, it's a great addition. For more information on fetching improvements to West Hollywood Park, visit weho.org slash whparkproject. I'm Eddie Robinson, WeHo TV News. Mike, back to you. And Zoe, go get it. Thanks, Eddie and Zoe. Through the month of December, the City of West Hollywood's WeHo Arts Program accepted poster design submissions for One City, One Pride 2018. Held each year from Harvey Milk Day, May 22nd, through the month of June, this 40-day festival celebrates the LGBT community through myriad public art projects. This year's theme is Remembrance. So in honor of this concept, let's take a stroll down memory lane with this One City, One Pride retrospective. In 2013, the One City, One Pride theme was The Sacred and the Profane, which explored the dichotomies of the LGBT experience. These contrasts were showcased in the CMG Short Film Festival, which featured serious shorts like Dominic Haxton's Teens Like Phil, alongside more irreverent works like Old Dog's New Tricks, and the motion comic Troy, Naked Boys Sing Behind Bars. 2014's theme of I Do reflected the Supreme Court's historic ruling of marriage equality. So, 3F and Planet Queer explored the concept of wedding receptions with their interactive, fairy-themed Midsummer's Afternoon Queer Wedding Reception, featuring live performances by Sister Montos, Purple Crush, and Devin Tate and the Traitors. 2015's WeHo at 30 theme celebrate the city's 30th anniversary. In honor of the occasion, West Hollywood's past was brought to life with an LGBTQ mobile walking tour written by the late great queer historian Stuart Timmons before his passing. Through this walking tour, a colorful cast of characters from different eras excavated WeHo through the decades. It's as if your history class was taught by queer cosplayers. 2016's Into the Streets, a reference to the rallying cry of early LGBT rights groups, focused on political activism, evidenced by From the Archives to the Archives, Queer Signs of the Times, 1965 to 2016. Curated by Ruben Esparza, this interactive exhibit featured 75 protest signs that were recreated and literally taken into the streets for a protest rally. And last year, against the backdrop of xenophobia that swept Trump into the White House, the Go West theme celebrated the concept of immigration. Trans artist Yasmit 
saluted cultural synergy with The Migration of the Monarchs, a three-part conceptual art project that juxtaposed wearable art with a cabaret that combined buto, kabuki, and Korean pansori. So how will this year's Remembrance theme be depicted? You'll just have to hit up West Hollywood in May and make some new WeHo memories for yourself. And now that you've finished your art history, class is dismissed. So go get some physical education with Nick Catelli. Some say it's just a game of tennis that's been shrunken down by using that ray and Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. Others believe it's a sport that helped reunite the United States and China back in the 70s, when in reality it was a sport that was created so people could, well, obviously, play indoors. I'm Nick Catelli for WeHo TV News, and we're going to compete in the ping pong open play. <gasps> that was my swing. Now, it's to my understanding you actually have a degree in ping pong, right? Like, that's a real thing. <laughs> that's, that's real, that's true. Uh, I got my degree in Germany, in Leipzig. Uh, uh, my degree is about competitional table tennis, like, um, like a very high performance uh, table tennis as, as an Olympic sport. Nice, now is there anybody that ever walks in here and you look at him and you're like, you know what? That guy could be an Olympian. Well, there's a lot of uh, people with potential, like not only like kids, but also like seniors or people with uh, disabilities playing here, and they have Olympic potential. Olympic potential? I like that. I like that. <laughs> do you do that thing like baseball players do, like before you about to serve, like you do like one of these, or like you kiss like a necklace or a locket or something? Yeah, or, I, I always like to do this with my pad, I'll be like, throwing it up. Like, do one of those? Sometimes I do like a little stamp on the ground. Okay, a little stamp. Just right. to try to... Um, Okay. Get my uh, opponent like not so focused. Mm -hmm. Get him out of focus. Okay. I like getting his mind. Cause ping pong, if you didn't know, is 90% physical and 10% mental. Yeah. yeah. Every day, everybody coming and we are playing and uh, we are enjoying. We are meeting each other. It's good fun for us. Everyone here started as strangers personally, and uh, over time we got to know each other, met, introduced each other by name. And over time, I think it's what, been at least eight consecutive months we've been coming back and overall, yeah, just getting to know folks. And we're here at the West Hollywood Plumber Park Invitational Ping Pong Tournament. As you can tell, things have gotten pretty intense here as the score right now is I don't know what it is to what it is, but look at how that handsome ball boy just threw that ball off. That was a very beautiful shot. Now, is there any kind of like pizzazz? Like, I feel like, you know, for doing that, be like, hmm. Well, uh, <laughs> try, try not to make your shots very long because if you do your swings very, very long, okay. then you're not going to be able to keep up. There you go. Very good. Uh, <laughs> uh, Excellent. You got it. Uh, oh. Back on my chin now. Behind the back. So whether you're an Olympian or a beginner or someone like me, they've got tables for every skill level here. Ping pong open play takes place at Plummer Park. It starts on Fridays at 4 o'clock and it goes to 9 o'clock. Again, I'm Nick Adelia for WeHo TV News, and I'm going to get back in there at the ping pong open play. I'll see you later. Thanks, Nick. The city of West Hollywood kicked off December by celebrating World AIDS Day with a candlelit vigil, followed by the ceremonies for the Paul Stark Warrior Awards, which honor individuals who provide services to people living with HIV and AIDS. We had a chance to meet up with one of these warriors for this month's Mic Drop. According to UN AIDS data, 36.7 million people were living with HIV in 2016. That's why somebody like Yolanda Reyes is so important. Over the past six years, Yolanda has been working in SHEP, the Sexual Health and Education Program at the Los Angeles LGBT Center, specializing in HIV prevention, treatment, and care services. On December 1st, as part of World AIDS Day, Yolanda's efforts were recognized when she received a Paul Stark Warrior Award. So today we've invited Yolanda to the West Hollywood Library, the site of another annual World AIDS Day tradition, the AIDS Watch 24-Hour Memorial, to learn more about how her work affects West Hollywood. It starts with education. So when we've had a client who is newly diagnosed and we talk to them about prep, because they have a partner. And they're like, why isn't this on the news? Why isn't this in commercials? Why isn't this something that my, you know, that my primary care physician elsewhere like mentioned to me? 
So PEP, PEP, post, uh, post exposure prophylaxis, is basically uh, a medical emergency, what we consider it. It's someone who's been exposed to HIV uh, through sexual contact or um, through people who inject drugs. If they believe that they were exposed to HIV, they have 72 hours, up to 72 hours, to get started on treatment. So it's a little like uh, Plan B or the morning after pill, exactly. but for HIV, yeah. which is great. Yeah. Whereas PrEP is um, pre-exposure prophylaxis, and it's for individuals who are HIV negative, who take the daily medication Truvada, and um, to reduce the likelihood of HIV transmission. So that's more like birth control. In the fight against HIV and AIDS, medications like PEP and PrEP have saved countless lives. But it's important to remember the many lives that have been lost. According to the World Health Organization, since the beginning of the epidemic, roughly 35 million people have died of HIV. That's why a portion of the Paul Stark Warrior Award Ceremony was dedicated to these fallen brethren. Uh, we were asked to speak the name out loud of someone who had passed away that we knew from HIV. And I think that was like the most... Um, the, the room literally just, at first, it, it started off slow, but towards like the end, Everyone was just, it's like a popcorn effect. Yeah. With me, at first I was thinking like, who do I know? But then it's all the people, all the patients from our clinic. It's a grim reminder that nobody is unaffected when it comes yeah. to HIV. Right now, um, Congress has been pushing in this tax reform, which will also be affecting healthcare. How may that potentially affect the center? At this point, uh, those services are free. Uh, but in the near future, they may, that might not be the case. Um, reason why it's so important for our center or for these services to remain free is because a lot of times um, people just don't have the money to come in and get tested. One last question, what can we just normal civilian Weehoans do to help our brethren with HIV and AIDS? Be supportive. Uh, many times the first thing that we tend to do, obviously, if we find out that our friend or loved one is uh, HIV positive, the first thing we do is worry for them, which is, which is a human feeling, um, human effect. Um, however, try to be there for them, try to understand them, understand that, um, sure, HIV is no longer like a death sentence. Um, however, a lot of times it's more of the emotional portion of it. As you can see, Yolanda Reyes is an important, compassionate warrior for the HIV AIDS community. And with an administration that's cutting health funding, this community needs every warrior it can get. I'm Mike Siriaco with WeHo TV News. Before we go, I'd like to take a moment to give a shout out to Yo Merrill, the talented artist who provided the animation for last month's segment on WeHo Arts The Plan, which you can see by hitting up this link. We'll be back next month with more news, noise, and nonsense. Until then, keep it cute, WeHo.